Thursday. Thursday is iffy because it's, I mean, the depends on if it shifts at all. If it comes any earlier, I think they'll call Thursday too. I think that the LTUSD will probably call Thursday. Um, we'll probably have class Thursday. Well, actually, but I can. Um, we won't have class for this class. Okay. We're still ahead enough, yeah. even um, even with me being being out. Um, I have a uh, an interview panel that I have to be in on Thursday and Friday, so we'll just not do. We won't try to make it up or do it Zoom or anything like that. We'll just make it up in on either side. Um, <clears throat> so no class on Thursday here, um, which probably means you have most of the day off on Thursday. So that'll be nice. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, don't go anywhere on Friday, I would say. Don't plan on, on anything. I'm already making plans to reschedule stuff for my other classes. Um, so hit, hit refresh. I think I hit save, but let me double check. Go to, and it's on week eight. So last week we we uh, ended talking about yeah week eight um, reductions and we specifically looked at the various reducing agents that we had various tools we had in our in our toolbox um, to take carbonyl compounds and turn them into uh, alcohols. Um, and we we had sodium borohydride, right? Um, and then we had, if we want had a carboxylic acid or an acid derivative, we couldn't use sodium borohydride because it wasn't a strong enough reducing agent. So we had to use the nuclear option, right? We had to use that lithium aluminum hydride, which just reduces the heck out of everything. Um, not a great compound to use in terms of safety. Um, but environmentally, it's actually not that bad. Lithium is not particularly nasty and, and that's pretty small amounts. And aluminum is pretty easy to deal with. It's more just a, a hazard in the lab and the short shelf life that makes lithium aluminum hydride sort of troublesome. Um, and then the other reducing reaction we had was that Grignard reagent, right? Um, and so we could make the Grignard reagents from any bromide. Chlorides too, but bromides are more commonly used. They have a better yields. Um, just by taking any alkyl halide or even a bromo or a uh, uh, phenyl bromide and turning it into um, the Grignard reagent, which is just inserts that magnesium in between the bromine and the carbon. Literally, you take metal, you take magnesium shavings, and you add them to to a compound. Um, usually, a lot of the bromides tend to be liquids, so so a lot of times it's just adding it directly to a liquid. Um, but if you have to do it in a solvent, you just pick something that's not going to react um, with the with the magnesium itself, which can get a little bit tricky to find that react that reagent because dichloromethane is normally our go-to, but dichloromethane won't work. And anything, you can't make Grignard reagent if you have any sort of acidic proton, because you just wind up with the magnesium acting as a base and pulling the proton off um, and deprotonating it rather than making the Grignard reagent. So you have to be, it has to be aprotic, has to not have any halogens in it, um, so it gets a little bit restrictive that way. Um, but yeah, in general, it's literally just magnesium turnings is what they call them, the little, the little flakes of magnesium. You just add that um, and give it give it time. Uh, which And that one's still on our schedule. I don't think we'll get to it this quarter, but next quarter, that's one of the labs we'll do. We'll make a Grignard reagent one week, and then we'll try and use it to synthesize something the following week. And... Also a reminder that we had 
one, you can do more than one Grignard reaction in a row. Um, and you can, usually there's more than one option because all you really need is a carbonyl and a bromide, right? So what carbon has carbonyl and what carbon has the bromide can change a little bit depending on what your R groups are um, and what you're trying to add. So if we're trying to make this two pentanol for part A, um, there are a couple ways we could do that, right? We could either could either take add a methyl group to butanaldehyde. Because that would be one of our R groups would be a methyl group, or we could add a propyl group to ethanaldehyde. <clears throat> and so that would be let me I'm gonna write on the board and probably should make sure that we'll be able to read it. So we've got the ethanaldehyde, or sorry, if we, if we can identify our two R groups, and remember that, that your carbon that has the oxygen attached that's going to start as a carbonyl um, doesn't count as an R group, as part of the R group. So it's, your R groups are what are attached to your carbon that has the oxygen. So we could either have a methyl magnesium bromide plus the pieces that are left on the other side would be the aldehyde with four carbons. Or the flip side to that would be, okay, we started with with a two carbon fragment, that's our aldehyde, then the other side would have to be our three carbons. Either way would give us the same molecule, right? And so again, like I like I mentioned last week, we really wind up um, use, when we're doing these green yard reagents, a lot of times it's, well, what do you have in the stock room? What do you have that's easy or cheap to get a hold of that you could use for these? Is it going to be, um, you know, methyl, methyl bromide might not be easy to come by this, probably a gas at room temperature, but, but methyl iodide is cheap and has a good shelf life. So get methyl iodide in the stock room, we're getting some magnesium and making region as a methyl iodide um, would be pretty straightforward and butanol is pretty common or um, ethanol ethanol iodide is uh, doesn't have great shelf life um, and it's got a very high vapor pressure so that one's probably not as common in soccerum but propyl bromide is going to be really common so there's a lot of, of possibilities there. All right, I have not had a chance to look at the at the uh, quiz questions yet. Um, so I'll, I'll open the, the floor right now. Do either of you have any questions about the stuff from last week? Yeah, that's the idea. The, the Reduction part, there's really, there's three options, right? Sodium borohydride, lithium aluminum hydride, and um, Grignard reagents. And while they're all pretty powerful, the differences between them are pretty straightforward. Um, I used the wrong. Yeah. 
like reduction kind of like does an oxidation to it. Like so, mm -hmm. if, if like rust is an oxidation, how come that like doesn't it able to be reversed? It can in some cases. Um, so in the case of, of as long as the oxide that you're making is still has similar physical properties in terms of solubility and in terms of structurally, you usually can. You can put it through electrolysis or you can use the right reducing agent. Um, so that's actually what you do when you polish silver. Silver, when it builds up that black tarnish, that tarnish is another word for silver oxide. Um, and silver polish is literally a paste of zinc metal. Zinc is a pretty good reducing agent and silver is pretty good at being reduced. And so you literally just return all that silver oxide back into being um, silver metal and then zinc oxide washes off. Exactly, you make zinc oxide, you turn the silver oxide into silver metal and zinc oxide um, and then you just can clean off the zinc oxide. But over time, you do wind up with the, those atoms get put, those same silver atoms get put back on, but not in the exact same spot. And so over time, if you had like really like delicate engravings or something like that, you're going to lose a lot of that detail work when you continue to do that. Um, and so you'll wind up with just a silver mirrored finish rather than having any sort of etching or anything like that over time. Um, and that's a similar thing. You can take an old rusted out car chassis and you can turn, you can undo some of the oxidation, but the problem with iron oxide is that iron oxide is flaky. It's not structurally the same, right? So it falls apart. And so you, and you can't put it back in if it's fallen apart already. It's more of a structural issue than it is a chemical issue. Um, but that's a good, so this was just practice with mechanisms. If we wanted to do this in a, these Grignard reagent mechanisms are pretty straightforward. We just have a methyl group in this case, which is going to act as a nucleophile. And when we have carbonyls, we have a good target for a nucleophile. It's not going to go through a substitution reaction. It's going to go through a, an addition reaction, a nucleophilic addition opposed to an electrophilic addition, which is most of what we saw with alkenes. Um, but because we have that partial positive, we can do a nucleophilic addition instead. And so your, your mechanism is just going to look like, okay, the electrons between the methyl and the magnesium, the methyl gets to keep those electrons. And so those electrons are just going to act as a nucleophile and attached to the carbonyl carbon, which means you need to break that carbonyl carbon. It it is it's, it's you know so my, the that dichotomy between ionic bonds and covalent bonds is sort of a false dichotomy because it's more of a spectrum, right? Um, and so what really happens is because the carbon is attached to a magnesium and the carbon is more electronegative, it's a lot like a halogen. It can act as a leaving group. And when it acts as a leaving group, it act, brings its electrons with it. Exactly. So you wind up with these electrons are going to come over here. But we can't have five bonds to that carbon. So we break that pi bond and you just would wind up with a deprotonated oxygen. And that's what step two is just add the water to it. The water is just a proton source. Your deprotonated alcohol will pull a proton off of the water molecule. If so, we'll talk about ethers next week, probably. Um, because it's just acting as a proton source, not as a nucleophile. We can have a, have it act as an e as a if we had our, an ether or if we had a, a, a deprotonated alcohol act as the nucleophile here to do the, then you could wind up with doing sort of a, a two step substitution where you break the carbonyl and add an ether and then turn that car that deprotonated alcohol into a good leaving group. So we'll talk about that later today.
um, and then in more detail going forward. But you can't do it with the green yard reagent because we just have the alcohol or the oxygen is just going to be a deprotonated. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if we had this happen twice, if we have an a um, acid derivative like an ether, this is a weird looking ether to us because we're not that used to ethers yet. Um, but it's a cyclic ether, but it's still an ether, right? You still have a carbonyl and then an oxygen and then, then another carbon, right? So it's still an ester. Sorry, I said ether. I meant ester. Um, it's a weird looking ester, but it can still go through the same process. Your first step, though, is going to be your methyl magnesium bromide. That's a lot harder to do that looking at that screen and drawing on the mouse pad than than it is uh, when I'm looking over here. Let's try that again. <laughs> so uh, the first step though is gonna look just like it did before. And you break the pi bond. So you added one methyl group in this case. And then you're going to wind up with, I'm going to, to white this out and redraw. Actually, I'll do it over on the whiteboard since I have that camera on. So your intermediate in this case. Here's our new methyl group that we just added. Because this is a decent leaving group, you wind up reforming the pi bond and kicking that carbon, breaking that carbon oxygen single bond. And so your, your first, your second intermediate, your more stable intermediate is going to look like here's our new methyl group. And then there was the oxygen was attached right where the methyl group is drawn. And now we just have a ketone, which can go through the same process that we had on the molecule right above. And so you wind up adding two methyl groups. And then it's when you get to step two, the proton transfer or the um, to protonate those those oxygens, you just wind up with two alcohols. Uh, on the same molecule because it was a cyclic ester to begin with. If it wasn't a cyclic ester, you just wind up with two separate molecules. All right, so that's all review. So hopefully that feels pretty, pretty good. Um, And this is more where I was headed. I forgot I had that, those mechanism practice slides um, to go along with your question, Rob, about oxidation and reduction being opposites of each other. If we just spent a whole lecture talking about reductions to make alcohols, what else can we expect? Oxidation of alcohols, right? If we can take a carbonyl and reduce it to make an alcohol, we can take an alcohol and oxidize it to make a, a carbonyl compound. Um, and so there's, there's a variety of ways to do that. And they have, they all have, just like with the reductions, there, there are pluses and minuses in both cases. Um, the most basic one is just if you expose um, if you expose an alcohol, either a primary or a secondary alcohol, to chromic acid, um, which is usually, we don't actually store chromic acid because chromates are really, really nasty. Um, you remember Aaron Brockovich? Um, that was all about, that was all about uh, chromium in the, in the water supply. So we try not to use chromium in solutions any more than we have to. Um, so we actually store chromates, dichromates, as sodium dichromate, 
But then if you take sodium dichromate and you expose it to concentrated sulfuric acid, you get chromic acid. And so then, so this is just a kind of a, they call it generating the chromic acid in situ, um, usually in italics to indicate that it's a Latin term. Uh, oh, wait, do that. Don't really. Um, I'm not going to try writing with the with the mouse pad. Um, so in situ, I, it's S I T U. This means in the situation where you're using. Uh, and that's just the, the fancy formal way of saying we're not going to add chromic acid on its own. We're going to put stuff together that will react to make chromic acid. And then the chromic acid will be the actual reactant. Um, and so if you take a primary alcohol and you expose it to chromic acid, you get a carboxylic acid. So that's just undoing what lithium aluminum hydride does, right? Lithium aluminum hydride takes a carboxylic acid, turns it into a primary alcohol. Chromic acid takes primary alcohol, takes it to a carboxylic acid. And same here, a secondary alcohol exposed to chromic acid gives you the ketone. Um, and there's a there's a mechanism that goes along with this that's not not too bad if you have the chromic acid. You wind up making this chromate ester, it's called. Um, and then the chromate, chromate ester basically will just go through an elimination reaction. It's weird because it's not an elimination reaction because it's an alkene. Um, but because this chromate is such a good leaving group, um, you can leave behind as, sorry, that'd be chromite is a good leaving. Um, chromate is CrO4 with a negative 2 charge. Chromite is CrO3 with a negative. So because chromate is easily broken up into chromite, that makes it so we can go through this step where we just have, okay, even water is all it takes to act as the, as the base here. You wind up making the carbonyl and this hydrogen chromite polyatomic ion. Um, and this is one, this is one where we're not going to spend too much time on this mechanism because this first step um, is not fully understood in terms of it. It seems like it could be something as simple as an SM2 reaction, but it's not because you don't get that inversion of the stereochemistry. So something else is happening um, and we don't have a whole lot of information that more of an inorganic reaction anyway. So we're dealing with the metal reactions. Um, and in general, this is not a mechanism that's need, that we need to spend that much time on. Um, because this is sort of an old school reaction anyway, um, for a couple reasons. So here's one of the things that is um, one of the reasons that we don't use this reaction too much is partly because just like with the lithium aluminum hydride, we couldn't stop at the aldehyde. When we, if we took a carboxylic acid and we exposed to lithium aluminum hydride, we were going to make primary alcohol. There was no way of stopping that way. We just see the same thing here. You can go alcohol to carboxylic acid, it's really hard to stop with the aldehyde. Um, but luckily, we have another reaction that can do that, that's based around the same general mechanism, it still uses chromium. Um, so it's what's called selective oxidation, and it uses um, a reagent called PCC, which is short for pyridinium chlorochromate, which basically just is a way of making the chromate a little bit less reactive. 
instead of being a true chromate, it's more, it's almost more of a chromite to the CrO3 with this Cl. Um, so this PCC reaction, and it has to be done in, in um, dichloromethane. Um, this, the, the net result of this is PCC can be used to reduce a, a secondary alcohol, uh, or sorry, to oxidize a secondary alcohol to a ketone. Um, and it can also be used to oxidize a primary alcohol and get it to stop at the aldehyde. Um, but both of these first two reactions have the probably one of the bigger reasons that that chemists are moving away from them um, is that they do have good results and good yields, um, but chromate is just really really nasty stuff. Um, especially from a health concern and a waste disposal concern. And so in, in the last decade or so, there's really been a big push towards what they call green chemistry, which is trying to do the same reactions, but with more environmentally friendly um, reagents. And that can mean either things that are easier to source environmentally so that you don't have to go you know, mining and creating all this, this environmental waste that way, or also just things that are easier to either recycle or, or store in a way that doesn't cause health problems and ecological problems for the waste. Um, so from perspective of green chemistry, neither of these is a very good reaction. Um, we still use this reaction for um, for a few reasons, it's actually really useful if you don't know, if you are pretty sure you have an alcohol, if you have an unknown compound, um, and you take an IR of it, it's really easy to see you have an alcohol, right? But if you don't know if it's primary, secondary, or tertiary, or a phenol, chromic acid is actually a really easy way to tell what type of alcohol you have. So if you add a little chromic acid to it, you're either going to make a carboxylic acid, which is really easy to detect, or you're going to make a ketone, which is really easy to detect, or you're going to make, or if it's a tertiary alcohol, nothing happens. Because a ter tertiary alcohol can't be oxidized with chromic acid. And phenols actually act in a different way entirely as well. So it's still useful from a qualitative analysis standpoint for trying to figure out what you have, but we're trying to get away from it in terms of synthesis. Um, so one of the reactions that that gets used that has a similar effect is called the Swern oxidation. Um, the Swern oxidation is just dimethyl sulfoxide, sulfon oxide, um, as the reactant, and this, um, and you wind up with that same net result. I have the mechanism here uh, on the next page. Let's see where that that carbon monoxide fluoride shows up. Um, one of the downsides though is it has to be really cold for this to happen. This only works at minus 78 Celsius, which sounds like a weird number, um, unless you know that that's the, uh, the melting point of dry ice. And so basically what you do is you do this reaction um, with dry in a dry ice bath. So you can't use, it's not like an ice bath where it's water and ice mixed together. You use dry ice in acetone because acetone won't freeze until less than 70, minus 78 Celsius. So if you do this in a dry ice acetone bath um, to get the right temperature, then you can do it at minus 78 Celsius. That's why it's, that specific number is called out. Um, its mechanism is considerably more complicated as well. Um, the first step is that that, that COCl2, COCl parentheses two, is this sort of oxal, let's see, it would be the IPAC name. It's oxalic acid as an acid chloride, which would be named as oxoil, oxoil chloride. 
um, or something like that. Yeah, there it is. Oxal oxalyl chloride. It's close. Um, and effectively, what you wind up doing is you wind up, this is another case where you put in situ reactive generate generation because this is the actual reactant that will react with your, your alcohol. Chlorodimethyl sulfonium ion. Um, and then your second step winds up being, okay, now your alcohol will impair the fact sulfur, you wind up making a sulfur oxygen bond, you wind up with triangle amine acting as a base, um, and then eventual net result is you wind up pulling the oxygen, or I guess we already pulled the oxygen off the sulfur, Chloride then leaves the second chloride and leaves the sulfur. Um, and you wind up with the oxygen that was an alcohol turning into a ketone or an aldehyde if we're doing this with a um, with a primary alcohol. And again, none of these work, none of these oxidations work with a tertiary alcohol. Tertiary alcohols can't turn into carbonyls without kicking off a carbon, right? And carbons make really, really bad leaving groups, even worse than hydrogens as a leaving group, right? Um, so this isn't one, I wanted to, to show this to walk through the process. This is not a mechanism we're gonna focus on in great detail because there's a lot of weirdness happen that happens with it. Not only is it a lot of arrows, it's a lot of arrows that don't behave the way we would normally expect them to do. It's all our standard steps, but kind of all arranged differently. Because there's lots of two steps happening at the same time, which are really hard to just track and remember what's going on, right? We'll get to some some reactions more like this, but that are more predictable um, in uh, in a chapter or two. Um, this mechanism also has, because it has so many steps that have to happen and your, your reactants have are larger molecules than the chromic acid, um, this actually has what's called low atom efficiency. So you can still get decent yields, but you have to, there's a lot of molecules that go into making those yields, um, which means that it's multiple things you have to worry about shelf life. It means that um, that just in terms of sheer weight from an engineering point of view, shipping to get these chemicals to you is really, really expensive because in most, for the most part, they're really hazardous chemicals, right? And hazardous chemical shipping is really expensive and it's always by weight as well. And so it's, it's a less ideal reactant um, reaction in general compared to these chromium-based um, reactions. Yeah, the chromium is really nasty to deal with as waste, but it's really easy and cheap to ship to you, and it sits on the, on the shelf really, really well. So, plus you don't need to do it at minus 78 Celsius. So that's additional expense too, right? You have to be able to maintain that low temperature in order for your reaction to happen. If all of these are the points against switching to the sorin oxidation, if you're do, doing this on an industrial scale, um, have have you two seen Breaking Bad the whole way through? Um, there's a point in it where they one of their supplies dries up for one of their precursor molecules. Um, and it was, it's right after they had designed their really fancy setup underneath the laundry mat, right? Um, and, and Jesse says something like, well, we could always go back to doing, doing a pseudo cook or something like that. And he's like, no, we just built our whole system around this setup. We can't go back and redesign everything. It's, and it's really, that's, it's a big issue with chemical engineering. And one of the reasons why um, there's such resistance to moving towards more renewables when it comes to a lot of uh, fuel sources it's because our infrastructure is already built. Yeah. And so all of that money is then waste 
um, if you don't have a way to sort of switch over parts of it here and there. And it's not, it's not necessarily even a fallacy in, in this case. In this, yeah, okay, well, we already have this system that we could, we could scrap this system, build an entirely new one for billions of dollars, and then 10 years down the road, it'll be profitable again. But that's not how, how corporations think, right? They need to be turning over profit every quarter to keep the shareholders happy. Um, and so you see the same thing, not just in fuel economy, but in, in a, any sort of manufacturing, any sort of, of large scale chemical engineering. Well, we're already set up to do it this way, unless it's something simple enough where we can just pull out one piece, put in a new piece, or switch out one reactant for a new reactant and still use the same machinery. There's always going to be resistance from an economics point of view. Exactly. Exactly. Um, which, and this is getting more into the economics and more into the political side, is one of the reasons that, that governments need to step in and regulate that and say, no, you have to switch over. Because otherwise, there's no, they will never do it, right? They will bet every dollar they can get out of their current setup before they even consider switching over. Um, this one is a similar procedure. Um, it's called the Desmartin for iodinane. Um, seems like there's an extra syllable in there, but that's actually correct. It's iodine per iodine A. A per iodine is when you have instead of a um, a per carboxylic acid or peroxy acid, where it would be it's carbonyl oxygen oxygen, it's carbonyl oxygen iodine. So the per iodine molecule. Um, but the, the net result is pretty similar. This is um, this DMP has an even worse shelf life and even more expensive than the reagents up above, but it can work at room temperature. So if the cost for DMP comes down more, this could wind up being a pretty useful reaction. In either case, three and four are both really useful, especially even at, at our scale. Um, yeah, we would have to source those molecules every year, but that makes more sense as a small college than, than to have this, these chromate salts we have to get rid of every year. Um, especially since our, our hazardous waste disposal is basically all of the inorganic stuff goes into the same jug and shows up at the South Auto Refuse once a month. Um, and then they have to deal with it. I don't know what they do with it, but generally most waste, most um, consumer level waste management um, just takes hazardous materials, just goes into a bucket and gets shipped somewhere. Um, be buried and forgotten about. Um, so from for us, it would make a lot of sense to start moving towards these. They are our use. And frankly, that sworn oxidation with the dry ice bath would be kind of a fun one to do anyway, right? Just to get the experience of doing the dry ice bath. Um, so maybe I'll look at seeing if I can find, we can source some of those chemicals and, and do that uh, in the future. Usually, for the most part, we just stay away from oxidation of alcohols because there's not really easy way to do it in a in a reliable and finessed way. We can always brute force oxidize them, but that's just burning, um, which doesn't really make a very good lab. All right, so and both of these. So everything other than number one will stop at the aldehyde for this for the primary complex. If you want to take an aldehyde and take it all the way to a carboxylic acid, you kind of are stuck with you use your chromic acid. But generally speaking, it's easier to take an aldehyde and oxidize it than it is to, to get to stop at a
Right, and they they look they're all they'll look pretty similar. Um, let's we'll go back to the swern oxidation. The swern oxidation is that DMSO and the oxalyl chloride followed by triethylamine. The selective oxidation with is with PCC and it just says PCC. So if you can remember these ones, two and four are pretty easy to remember. It's just, they don't even say PCC. Um, and number four will say that per iodinane DMP, thank you. Um, it will say DMP in that formula. Right, so with that in mind, let's do a little practice. Some of these are oxidations, some of them are reductions. Let's see if we can re we can figure out what reagents we need for each of these. And there's more than one right answer for some of these, right? For a lot of the oxidations, actually. So for the reductions, we, had, we only had three choices for the reductions, and they all had significant differences, right? So it's pretty clear cut in most cases what type of reduction it, producing agent we want to do. Um, use sodium if it's if you're adding hydride, use sodium borohydride unless you have to use it. If you're adding an R group, it has to be a green air agent. Um, for the oxidations, because they're four different choices, three of which are functionally identical as far as what you get out of it. Um, for, for a question like this, where it's what is your general um, reaction or what is your reactant, one of the general ways you show this without getting specific, is a lot of times you'll just see an arrow like this with, a, with an O in brackets above the arrow. That just means oxidize it. Um, and that's sort of the catch-all, unless you need unless you need to specify one type of oxidation specifically, um, then then you can you will see that sometimes where you say it oxidizes and this is what you get. Um, now for this for as. This type of question, though, I want you to be a little bit more specific. Pick one of the options that you have and write it out. Um, and you can, you actually can also write chromic acid, like for for reasons of, of um, showing more of what's going on. For if you're just doing a regular chromic acid oxidation, you can just write 
H2 C up and CR over 4. So, does that get the chromic acid oxidation? So, chromic acid, DCC, Swern oxidation, or the uh, DMP are all reasonable. And actually, any, any of the four of them will work for A, right? It's a secondary alcohol, so we don't need to worry about the stopping halfway part. Um, you can't use any of our four oxidation methods to further oxidize a ketone. If you wanted to oxidize this any further, we'd be chopping on the carbon. There are ways to do that, um, but we haven't dealt with them yet. For B, it matters a little bit more. This is also an oxidation, right? But it's a primary alcohol going to an aldehyde. So three, two, three, or four all work. PCC, Swern oxidation, or the DMP oxidation. You just can't use the chromic acid oxidation because that would take it all the way to the carboxylic acid. Same with C. B and C are going to use the same reagents, right? Same issue. We're making an aldehyde, not a carboxylic acid. D takes the same molecule for B, but we do want the carboxylic acid. So in this case, you would have to use the, the carboxylic acid, which Again, it can be written as just H2CrO4, or it can be written as sodium dichromate um, with H2SO4 in the water. I'll skip back a few slides just to make sure that I wrote that the same way. Yeah. So, or you can, for, for this class, I don't want you to recognize this, but when you're writing it out yourself, it's okay to just write H2CR04. If we want to undo the reaction in B. We want to take the aldehyde and turn it back to primary alcohol. What are we what are we going to use? So our reducing agents were the hydrides or green yard reagents, right? We had two varieties of hydrides. In this case, you could use the, the nuclear option. It doesn't make sense from a practicality standpoint, but lithium aluminum hydride would do this. It would just be overkill. So sodium borohydride would be the better option. And if we're trying to do a reduction, um, so an F is going to be the same thing, right? I'm doing part A. This is taking a ketone turkey back to a secondary alcohol. So we would want to use that sodium borohydride. We only need to use a green yard reagent when we've changed our carbon skeleton, right? Super powerful, but also kind of niche. If we're not changing our carbon structure, if our carbons are all the same, don't worry about green yard reactions. All right, let's take our break. Um, that was fairly dense. There was a lot of material there. But the good news is, is that none of those mechanisms are likely to show up on, on tests because they're, again, pretty niche. Other than the Swern oxidation is the most interesting, um, but it's also 
like maybe on the take home problem, I might have you go like write out a mechanism for something like that where I don't tell you what chapter it's in and you have to go find it again. Wait, what was that reaction called? And then go search it out, but not on the time class in class part. Um, in fact, I when I was looking when I was making these slides, I usually um, I usually could just take the slides from last year and change the dates on them, make sure that we covered the same material last lecture that I don't need to grab stuff from last, end of last slides, that kind of thing. Um, I actually didn't have any of these slides in here. I think I just very generally, here's here's three ways to oxidize and don't worry about any of the mechanisms um, when I did this last time. So I wanted to show you this time since we have the time and we're, we're moving pretty quickly. But don't worry too much about that. So let's come back at 10 after. Um, I'm going to run over and uh, make sure I have everything prepped for lab for later since Muriel is out of town. And uh, But yeah, I'll be back at 10 after and we'll pick right back up.
Um, I've heard of your honor. Yeah. Okay. I like Brian Cranston a lot. That's the first time it's like, you know, good guy and bad guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have not been, we tried to start bear but every episode is a little too chaotic and like yeah. and uh it's good but by the time we put the kids to bed we've had enough of the everybody shouting over the top of each other at the same time exactly And I've, I've never worked in a restaurant, so I can't, but I've heard it's pretty like right. close to home for. It's, yeah, it's like the, I got the best and worst. You know? yeah. yeah. I've, that's, that's how I feel about a lot of the um, education shows, like the Abbott Elementary and stuff like that. Like I've never taught elementary school, but a lot of the same stuff uh, where it's like, oh, I don't know if I can watch that because that's not funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. Um this is the one I I'm didn't have good results with that one. So maybe we'll do the free radical brumination. Except for lab today. Yeah, sorry, I'm talking to myself. Um, we need to use the UV light for the free radical bromination, which is really cool, except that Mario will put it away somewhere. Oh, yeah. It's the one I I used it. I It was mine from home, and I left it on the cart after last time we did this, and I don't I know where it got put. Off. No, she's on vacation. She would she would respond, but I don't want to do that to her. I'm just trying to figure out. Okay, well, what can we do then? Um, we could probably do cyclohexene. I think we have cyclohexene. All right. Well, I have an idea of what we're going to do then. I still don't know exactly what we're going to do, but close enough that we'll be able to. I'll be able to figure it out after class ends. So we still have a few more minutes of break. Not trying to short you on your break.
Uh, you know what, that's what we'll do. We'll do the thermodynamic versus kinetic control. That's a good lab. Okay. All right, well then let's go ahead and jump back in here. Um, there's a few more. I'm just gonna reorder these on the fly real quick because I think it probably makes more sense. Talk about this after. There we go. All right. So alcohols we're just because we're talking about alcohols now doesn't mean our old reactions stop being useful. So just like we've seen before, substitution reactions show up with all functional groups, right? And elimination reactions can show up in various forms with all functional groups. Um, so when we're talking about, about alcohols in terms of um, substitution reactions, there are a few things we have to consider. The, the most basic one, though, is if it's a tertiary alcohol, we don't actually really have to change anything because the leaving group leaving is already the slowest step of the reaction, of the reaction right? So, the, and we don't really, we're not pushing the alcohol off with our reactant, with our, with our new nucleophiles. We don't really even need to worry too much about these two nucleophiles competing. There will be, to some extent, this will be an overall an equilibrium reaction um, that's going to favor the alcohol. We're not going to get great yields doing it this way, but it is that simple. If we have some way of, say, removing water as it's formed, then we can actually cause this reaction to happen with a pretty good degree of, of completion um, simply by having a drying agent present. You just add a concentrated acid, concentrated hydrochloric acid, and remove the water as it's being um, as it's being generated, and you can get this reaction to happen pretty reliably. However, that only works with SN1 reactions. With SN2 reactions, because it's more of a, an active um, tug and, and tug of war between the two nucleophiles, um, we need to do something in order to get decent yields. Um, we can just use HVR and you do get okay results. Uh, and you do see that it is, it's still SN2 because we do get that inversion of stereochemistry. Um, but that's not great. It's not going to get us great yields. It'll still have that. The um, we still will also produce water, so we can still allow it to you know drive off the water as this is happening uh, to try and and encourage this reaction to happen. Uh, but with the SN two reactions, it's less effective. Um, so we have these other two approaches instead. Um, one of which makes the alcohol a better leaving group. You've seen this before, right? Make the alcohol a better leaving group by exposing it to this calcium chloride. Um, and you make that, you attach your that TS group to the oxygen, and now all of a sudden it's a good leaving group, and, and something as simple as bromide can come in and act as a nucleophile and push it all off. The the third approach is basically to make the bromide a better nucleophile. 
instead of making the oxygen a better leaving group, you can just make bromine a better nucleophile. Um, and you do that by basically having it react with a, let's see, that's going to be a Lewis acid. Let's see, Lewis acid is the electron acceptor, yes, with a Lewis acid. By having the bromide react with a Lewis acid, the bromide becomes a much better nucleophile. And then it just goes through a straight SM2. And that's the same thing that we see here. Um, chlorine is a weak enough nucleophile under normal circumstances that we basically we can't brute force it and accept low yields. Chloride is not a good enough nucleophile to be able to do that without either making the oxygen a better leaving group or making the chloride a better nucleophile. But both of these, the middle option on the left and the top option on the right, uh, let's take it back. Middle option, we don't use the toss of chloride with when we're trying to chlorinate something. I take that back, I misread that, because it also had purity. Um, both of these for the chloride then are going to be make the chloride a better nucleophile, and they're going to work more or less the same way. No, I was right. They just doesn't. They're not using the tosylate. I don't remember why. That is probably the tosyl chloride winds up interacting if it's if you use hydrochloric acid. Um, okay. So I can go back to my original logic. Apologies for switching back and forth. Over here, the top option with the chloride is making the oxygen better leaving group, and the bottom option is making the chloride a better nuclear file. The way I said it first. And over here, we've got the brute force approach, make the oxygen a better leaving group, or make the bromide a better nucleophile. Um, and the mechanisms wind up being pretty similar in both cases. So if you use the dichloro sulfoxide, the SOCl2, Effectively, what you do is you wind up making a, an oxygen sulfur bond. The chlorines that are attached to the SOCl2, the chlorides are pretty good leaving group from the sulfur. Um, and so what happens is you replace a chloride with a sulfur oxygen bond. You get this intermediate in the bottom middle here. And then the pyridine is going to act as a base to deprotonate your alcohol. Uh, pyridine is a really useful base because it's not a great nucleophile and it's a, it's a pretty gentle base, it's a weak base um, that also won't act as a nucleophile much of it at all. Um, so this, you see this a lot. This pyridine is basically just a benzene ring where one of the carbons is replaced with a nitrogen. So that gives it a way that it can be protonated um, by where it won't have this that nucleophile. And so then we make the net result here is that we turned our alcohol into a really good leaving group. And a good enough leaving group that a chloride can come in and act as a nucleophile to an SN2. And your final product here is you get sulfur dioxide, which leaves can leave as a gas, which is pretty handy. Um, for equilibrium purposes as well. It's not great in that sulfur dioxide is really, really bad smelling um, and toxic. It's pretty bad. It's one of the main causes of acid rain um, is the sulfur dioxide being produced from coal burning power plants. You take sulfur dioxide and you expose it to water, you make sulfurous acid. You, you turn that SO2 into a sulfite. Um, the same way that CO2 dissolved in water makes carbonic acid, um, SO2 mixed with water makes sulfurous acid. And if that's happening in the upper atmosphere, you get acid rain. Um, so it's good from a chemical standpoint, less so from an environmental standpoint, as we've seen several times today. But this, the whole process here is 
Take a bad leaving group, make it a good leaving group, do an SN2. And as we've seen before, it's always a matter of find a partial negative and back a partial positive. Do a little rearranging. Leaving group leaves, proton transfer, SN2. Um, we've seen the TOSO chloride. We didn't really get into the mechanism for it. It works. It's it's a more complicated looking mechanism. It's a, the, the tosylate um, molecule is a larger molecule. It's the same general process. You make a sulfur oxygen bond that makes the oxygen easy to leave or uh, more likely to leave. For these ones where we're going to make the, the, our nucleophile a more effective nucleophile, I swear this is not. Okay, so it does say. Oh, it's when it's iron bromide. That's what it's not phosphorus bromide. Um, similar process, sim similar net result, but a much simpler process. Oxygen can attach to a phosphorus, makes that a good leaving group. Bromide can come in and push it off. So just in one step in this case. I thought that this was a Lewis acid base reaction, but I it was it's way off. All right, and so it's going to be the same thing every time. This one's a simple one. Four arrows in two steps. Lone pair to phosphorus. That whole thing now is a good leaving group. And your bromide comes over and attaches as an SN2. These are effective also because it does allow us to preserve that stereochemistry. Right? We do the umbrella flip, but if we started with a single stereoisomer, we end with a single stereoisomer. Um, this is just some more practice drawing mechanisms, the same ones we just did, plus a lithium aluminum hydride one. All right, so B is pretty straightforward. That SOCL2 one, that's a little bit trickier. Let's see if you can work your way through that one, and we'll do it up on the board.
So I'm never quite sure in this class how, maybe it seems really obvious to me having taken this class a long time ago and then taught it lots of times. And it's really just copying the exact same arrows every time. It's just what the rest of the molecule looks like, right? But that doesn't make it easy. And it, I recognize that sometimes that aspect, the fact that it is a different molecule, as obvious as it seems to me that it's the same, might not be the same to you. So, so I'm giving you plenty of time, even though we just did these mechanisms, um, practicing drawing them through the repetition, it's helpful, even if it is just the same arrows again. Try and do it. Just like with your flash, with making flashcards, try and do it without checking the answer, and then go back and see if you got it right. It's really effective here. You don't need to be doing this in class necessarily, because I think at this point you can do that on your own. But it's still helpful for you know raising questions, figuring things out. All right. So for this first one, that SOCl2 looks like. This right, and our oxygen from our our uh, butanol is going to come in here and attach. With this being sulfur, we don't have to break that ox sulfur oxygen pi bond because sulfur can't have more than four bonds, right? Um, as far as whether it would be more stable. That way, I'm not going to get that picky. This is class based on sulfur chemistry, um, but we could work on it. So if it's got just to save me the time from from yeah. So as it is, sulfur actually has. I think it's missing a lone pair that they're not showing in that structure. I think the sulfur does have a long pair, or else it would have a formal charge of plus two. And it can't have a formal part of charge of plus two if everything else is neutral. So there is a long pair that's just not even drawn because it doesn't play a role. It doesn't really make a difference. I was just trying to make the connection back to Gen Chem when we did formal charge. Um, winds up not being all that useful. Point is, we don't need to break the pi bond to make room for it the way we would with the carbon. You can just draw it like this. Uh, we do actually run that actually we get the sulfur a minus charge, the oxygen a plus charge. So we wind up with an intermediate that looks like plus charge of oxygen, sulfur, chloride, chloride, double bond with another oxygen. Um, And then we're going to have chlorine leaves, takes its electrons with it. And that makes the whole thing a better leaving group, right? Then we wind up with all of this together. Is a pretty good leaving group. This whole thing is our good leaving group. So that chloride that we just created. I guess the next step was um, was uh, proton transfer for the purity. So we get a proton transfer, so we deprotonate it there. And then right after that, we're going to wind up with chloride coming in from the opposite side. Oxygen leaves, takes its electrons with it.
And so then our final product is going to be putting fluoride there. We temporarily wind up with this SO2Cl. But it doesn't stay like that. That winds up fragmenting. We get the SO2 and another fluoride. It has the final product there. So that's basically an SO2 fluoride Yeah. And the, so the net result of the whole reaction is it's an SN2 reaction where the fluoride replaces a hydroxide. Um, uh, this does show the chloride leaving all this one step, but it, again, not a class on sulfur. So whether if you wanted to draw that as two separate steps, the way we had it here, or show it, um, that SN2 plus the chloride leaving the sulfur, I'm not going to be thinking about that one because, again, not a class on sulfur. But, and all of that is just to get to the point, these first three steps are just to get to the point where the chloride is a strong enough nucleophile compared to the leaving group. This is a sulfur dioxide of really poor nucleophile and a really good leaving group. Um, we just needed to go through all this step just to prep everything. If you've ever done any work um, painting on a, on a house, painting rooms or anything like that, that's the prep work is where all the work happens, right? <laughs> That's what this is. This is our prep work and then the painting is the easy part. This is just an SN2. Getting there is the tricky part. It's the taping, it's the sanding, it's the... Yeah, exactly. I don't know about you, but it's, one, my wife is really, and her whole family are really good. Her dad has flipped houses his whole life. And, and so she's really good at painting houses. Um, and I don't do it to their standards. And so... <laughs> Like I just have this this fear of painting, and plus I just really don't like the cleanup aspect. I hate opening a can of paint, and then I know I'm going to spill drops on it of stuff, and then it's going to, and or the floor or the carpet or whatever. So I have this mental block about painting houses, but even I know it's all about the prep. Yeah. yeah, or if it's totally stripped, I don't mind it if it's like. Empty, like, oh, if I still paint, it's going to be on subfloor or the garage or something, like, fine. But I really hate painting how, you know, rooms that have stuff in them. It's so satisfying. It is. It is. All right. And so the, the PBR3, that one is really straightforward, right? Compared to the SOCL2, it's the same thing. Your first step is just prep the leaving group. And then your second step is, there it is. And then your second step is an SN2. So in this case, we wind up with the oxygen attaching to the phosphorus. And again, with the, we don't need to worry about, we do break a bond, but we don't need to worry as much about the phosphorus with making five bonds or having 10 electrons on phosphorus because it's a third row element. PBR3 has a Lewis acid reaction happens when you do electrophilic substitution on benzene. So that's that's where it's coming down the pipeline. You know I've seen this one where it's a Lewis acid. Um, sorry, still was running through that in my mind. So we then we make that phosphorus oxygen bond. Still keep the same stereochemistry. Yeah. 
Yeah. You want to make sure it didn't show the proton transfer step first. So then second step is just I lost the carbon. So two steps, four arrows. And the net result. Is we brominated, put the bromine where the alcohol was and make this phosphorus oxygen bromide on All right, we're going to skip the reduction one um, just for a second. I'm going to step outside and blow my nose because I'm choking right now. I got COVID very last quarter and like sick of the three. I was talking to Carl about the immunology of living in a tourist town <laughs> yeah. and oh. having kids at the same time. Yeah. It's like it, it shouldn't be possible to get as many colds and flus and illnesses as we do in a single year, but it happens every year. Mm -hmm. You would think, although the, the other side of parenthood is the sleep deprivation, and that doesn't help things either. Um, if we're going to do elimination reactions with alcohols, it works more or less the same way. We just need to make the alcohols better in the group. Um, if it's if we can make a that's a flawed figure. Where did they get that? No, it's not. Okay, never mind. I thought I lost it. I was pulling that off. Carbon off. Um, so we can use heat and acid to make the, the alcohol better leaving group and then rely on the fact that if we heat it, we're going to be driving off the alcohol or the uh, water. The downside to that is one, heat can break down our product. And two, a lot of times we'll make a product that evaporates at a temperature that's not significantly different than the water. Um, so we can wind up losing a lot of our products to evaporation. Um, so this is a less than ideal situation. We can do this in an ideal world, a theoretical world, this works. Practically speaking, less so. So we do the same thing that we do with the, um, to make the oxygen a better leaving group. We make a better leaving group by adding a tosylate group to it. That makes it pretty easy to just come in and use a um, strong base. Although we do need to be paying attention that we don't use a strong base that's going to um, compete and cause an SN2 reaction to happen. Uh, if we just used sodium hydroxide here, hydroxide is all of a sudden it's a pretty good nucleophile too, right? It's small. So we wind up just replacing with the alcohol with another alcohol um, and wind up with not great yields that way. If we use something a little bit bigger, like an ethoxide group, we probably don't want to use a T-butoxy um, because then we start getting into the Zaitsev versus the Hoffman product issue. 
if there's no difference between our products, you could use something that's a strong base that's a really bad file for sure. Reasons like TPU toxide. Um, so TPU okay could come in here and and work really well. But if we want this eight step product, we have to be careful with that. If we want the Hoffman product, that's fine. Um, but if we want this eight step product, we have to be careful what they use. It can't be a small base. Because we don't, we want to minimize the substitution products, but we also don't want to use a big base because that's going to limit our the um, ZSEP product. And so, and that's all pretty much just review, right? Nothing really new here. So the last new topic to add. Is the it's kind of a it's a tool in synthesis and it's really uh, it's more of a concept than one single reaction and that's the idea of a protecting. There'll be sometimes with these synthesis problems, especially as we get to more and more functional groups on our molecules, where you need to put it through a reaction, but you need to prevent one of your reactive groups from interacting with the reactant. So in this case, if we were trying to turn this into if we were trying to turn this molecule into a Grignard reagent, we can't just, this is a bromide, but we can't just expose it to magnesium because the magnesium metal would just act as a base and pull off the hydrogen. We would just wind up deprotonating the alcohol instead of making a Grignard reagent. So with that in mind, what you have to do is you have to, it's called protecting the OH group by basically disguising. It's not even really disguising, that's not even the right way to think about it. You turn it into something non-reactive temporarily that you're then going to reverse later. Right, so ties up the electrons. It yeah, basically it ties up the electrons. It's similar to taking the oxygen and making it a better leaving group but with the opposite net effect. You take the oxygen and convert it to something else that is only on that reaction, only undone in a very specific way down the line. Exactly. And so there's, there's very, very, again, this is really a niche reaction. This TMS chloride, trimethylsilane chloride, um, in triethylamine, as the effect of you attach an oxygen, or you attach this TMS group to the oxygen, which then makes it totally unreactive. It's more like an ether than it is like a um, an alcohol now, but it maintains the stereochemistry. So it's not just doing an SN2 with an ether, um, and it does, and it has really good um, high yields down the line when we remove the reactive, the protecting group. So once you do that, then we can expose, we can make the Grignard reaction, the Grignard reagents from the bromide. And then it can go through a Grignard reagent or a reaction and then on, you know, and then uh, protonate the alcohol. So all of this is just the Grignard step. We make the Grignard reagent, do the Grignard reaction. And then the last step is remove your protecting. Um, and so, and again, I this is something that this is more higher level in terms of synthesis problems. I'm not going to give you synthesis problems um, where you have to do this, generally speaking. Um, there might be some, some synthesis problems where you could use this in this class, but usually there's another way around it. If you just did your steps in the opposite order, you could get around it. Um, but it's, it's a concept I want you to be aware of. This idea that when there's multiple functional groups, you have to be aware of all the functional groups in the molecule and how they're going to react because you wind up with a lot of things happening. We have a lot of reactions in our toolbox now that we need to be aware of. Um, and as we get to more and more complicated synthesis targets, more and more functional groups tend to be involved. All right. Here's the other side. So 
last thing we're going to talk about today, and I already mentioned it. Um, this is just a recap of the um, oxidations of alcohols and phenols. So if we want a secondary alcohol and we want to turn to a ketone, the simplest way is our, is our chromic acid or dichromic acid. If we have a primary alcohol and we want a carboxylic acid, we're going to use the chromic acid approach again. If we have primary alcohol and we want it to stop at the aldehyde, we can use any of these three, PCC, the uh, Desmartin periodinate, or the Stern reaction will all stop at the aldehyde. And all three of these would also work here. Um, but this is the one that we haven't talked about. I mentioned that if you that the um, if you expose a phenol to chromic acid, it reacts in a totally different way. One of the reasons that the chromic acid is so useful in terms of telling what kind of alcohol you have is because. Carboxylic acids are really easy to tell apart from ketones, and they're both really easy to tell apart from tertiary alcohols. And the tertiary alcohol won't go through either of these reactions. And a phenol, when you expose it to chromic acid, makes this benzophenone molecule. You can actually oxidize a phenol, but not by oxidizing the carbon that already has the oxygen attached. It does do that slightly. Right. Um, taking that carbon, giving an extra carbon oxygen. You actually wind up making this molecule instead, which has a very different. This is visually. You, all you have to do is look at this, um, and the color changes. I got really confused by this in my organic qualitative class um, because one of my unknowns was phenol, and I tried to do this the chromic acid test to see if it was a um, primary alcohol, secondary alcohol, or tertiary alcohol. And it turned purple, um, which was not one of the results I was expecting. And I asked the teacher, and he goes, Oh, well, phenols don't react like that. They react in a totally different way because they make this, which then reacts with the chromium. And you make this chromium benzophenone complex that absorbs light and invisible each. So you make this really cool purpley dye out of it. Um, so, really useful in that context. And again, I'm, uh, this is what I want you to be aware of because this chromic acid is so universal still. Despite being toxic and the fact we're trying to phase it out, it's still really universal reagent. So I want you to be aware of what happens when you oxidize the null, you get benzophenone. Which isn't technically speaking still aromatic. We haven't gone through the rules for, for aromaticity yet. It's not actually technically aromatic anymore. Um, but it's got a very high degree of resonance. Everything, all of these four pi bombs can all resonate with each other, right? Um, which makes it fairly stable. All right. Questions about alcohol reactions? It's mostly substitution and elimination, or Reduction or oxidation are most of our reactions that we had that we're thinking about here, right? Um, again, lots of possibilities, but also, um, yeah, if you put them into the broad categories, there's only a few categories of reactions. It's just there's a lot of specifics and details you have to remember. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Remembering that it's a primary alcohol you have to be one of the stop And doing something like giving you this reaction and then the very next page giving you one of the same molecule with one of these is something that I would probably do. That's, that's the sort of thing I would do on a test. Let's see, do you remember the difference between this method of oxidation or that method of oxidation? Right, so that's a, a good detail to be paying attention to. Cool. Well, see what happens on Thursday? Or? Um, so, no, so we won't have class on Thursday because I have those interviews. Oh. Um, so, 
regardless of what the snow's doing, don't come to OCAM on Thursday. Thank you. 